opportunity to share this session. I would like to invite the speaker of the uh, session, first speaker, uh, Professor Shinji uh, Sasa. Uh, he is a TC chair, TC213 chair, edit. Uh, he is head of the Soil Dynamics Group and Research Director of International Research Center for Coastal Disasters, Port and Airport Research Institute, National Institute of Marine Port and Aviation Technology, and National Research and Development Agency in Japan. He obtained his uh, doctorate from Kyoto University. He is best known for his uh, seminal works on wave-induced seabed liquefaction that have been uh, cited uh, worldwide. His main research areas are soil dynamics, geodynamics, coastal and offshore geotechnics, subaqueous sediment and gravity flows, and ecological geotechnics. He, he was an invited panelist twice at the 15th and as well as the 17th ICSMG events, served as a panelist leader for the UNESCO conference. Uh, he's a recipient of numerous awards, including commendations by the Prime Minister for the Disaster Prevention Merit and by the Minister of, uh, Minister of uh, Lowland, sorry, Land Infrastructure, Transport and Tourism as a representative of Technical Emergency Control Force. Uh, he has, uh, and then he has Best Paper Awards from Soil uh, Science and Foundation Journal. And he has got many awards from the Japanese Geotechnical Society. And uh, he has been outstanding, I should say, in a simple word. And uh, I would like to invite him to deliver his lecture. Uh, Professor Sasa, we would like to have a lot of interactions with you because uh, we need uh, your uh, support to work together in this important area of uh, um, cost erosion. Thank you, Professor. Please welcome. Welcome. I welcome you. Welcome you for this. Thank you very much for Professor Babu for your kind yeah. introduction. And now I'd like to share my slide. So, uh, can you see this slide? Yes, sir. It is visible. Okay. Okay. So I will start. The, I'm Shinji Sasa. The head director at National Institute of Maritime Port and Aviation Technology. And here I report some recent advances in the mechanics and countermeasures of score and internal erosion. In particular, uh, I present the, a concise review of the structure interruptions from geotechnical and hydrodynamic perspectives. The content is divided into four parts. First, I describe the background and the importance of the theme. And I then present tsunami seabed structure interruption by focusing on seepage erosion, effect of overflow and seepage coupling of score of case and breakwaters with its countermeasure. Next, I would like to highlight wave seabed structure interruption here I will show that wave-induced liquefaction and score protection around a monopile are closely interrelated, and that will be followed by the mechanics and processes of internal erosion, cavity formation, and collapse behind seawalls and clay walls with its effective countermeasure. Finally, I would like to summarize the key contents. As an introduction, Tsunami and wave seabed structural interactions have received increasing attention in recent years following the devastating impact of the 2011 off the Pacific coast of Tohoku earthquake tsunami, ongoing development of oceanic infrastructures such as offshore wind turbine foundations, and the need for coastal disaster risk management. The mechanics and countermeasures of score and internal erosion plays a pivotal role in such tsunami and wave seabed structure interactions. The theme is multidisciplinary in nature and hence requires both geotechnical and seabed structure interactions. I first present tsunami seabed structure interactions by focusing on seepage erosion and the effect of overflow and seepage coupling on the score Location breakwaters with its countermeasure. 
I then present wave seabed structure interaction by highlighting wave induced liquefaction and scope protection around the monopile and the mechanics and countermeasure of internal erosion, cavity formation, and collapse behind sea walls and clay walls. I first present tsunami seabed structure interaction. Tsunami seabed structure interactions are schematically shown in this slide. In fact, the upper figure shows tsunami induced forces on case of breakwaters, which is mainly comprise of tsunami wave force and tsunami induced overflows and seepage flow and other related forces. The lower figure shows the corresponding failure modes of the foundation that consist of scoring, erosion, piping boiling, and shear failure. These failure modes and processes are closely interrelated. I will show some key mechanisms of the concurrent processes of the instability of foundation and the tsunami. It is essential to reproduce a prototype scale stress field in clarifying the instability of structure foundation. Geocentrifuge makes it possible and has proven effective in studying fluid soil interaction problems such as wave-induced instability of seabed soils. Indeed, the role and importance of centrifuge testing in fluid soil structure interactions has recently been emphasized. Here I report the novel use of geocentrifuge for studying tsunami seabed structure interactions involving the role of tsunami-induced overflow and seepage on score and erosion. The seepage flow in the rubble mound becomes turbulent due to the high permeability of mound as crushed rocks. The similitudes for such turbulent seepage flow as well as overflow have been satisfied together with the mechanical similarity between the model and the prototype. I first present the progress of seepage erosion. Tsunami-induced seepage can induce erosion in the sandy ground beneath the rubble mound of Cason breakwaters. Actual breakwater was targeted and the experiments were performed and the conditions where no sliding and overturning were allowed to occur in order to focus on the erosion process of the ground. The results show the seepage erosion progressed with time at the vicinity of rubble sand interface. The eroded mass deposited in the onshore side of the mound in accordance with the onshore direction of the seepage flow. Accordingly, Kason settled owing to the tsunami induced seepage erosion. Now the effect of overflow and seepage coupling on score of case of breakwaters. The coupled tsunami overflow and seepage actions can promote the development of mound score significantly, causing bearing capacity failure of the mound, resulting in the total failure of case on, case on breakwaters, which otherwise remained stable without the coupling effect. Indeed, the figure on the top right indicates that without seepage, the square front stopped far from the case on tool. By contrast, the coupled overflow and seepage promoted the mound square substantially, resulting in the total failure of the breakwater. The velocity vectors obtained from the high resolution image analysis as shown on the figure left indicate the series of such concurrent processes 
of the instability involving scores of mound and seabed bearing capacitive favor as indicated by the upward direction of the arrow and the flow of the foundation leading to the instability of the case of breakwater and the coupled overflow and seepage. The influence of placing an embankment that is elevated bound as a countermeasure was examined by employing different bank thickness. The embankment suppressed, significantly suppressed the effect of such coupled overflow and seepage in accordance with the decreasing hydraulic gradient that manifested underneath the caissons, thus preventing bearing capacity failure, resulting in the stabilization of the caisson breakwater. Without the countermeasure, the scar front reached caisson toe, yielding the phenomenon of significant washout that was boiling, giving rise to the formation of a cavity underneath the underneath the remaining caisson. Such cavity formation underneath remaining caissons was found to be consistent with what was observed following the 2011 off the Pacific coast of Tofu earthquake, earthquake tsunami. Tsunami resistant breakwaters has been developed based on the outcome of recent research that I mentioned. Here I am showing the sketch of, for, of such new form breakwater. The embankment reinforces the caisson against the tsunami wave force and suppresses the effect of the coupled overflow and seepage on score, as I mentioned. Such new form of breakwater with embankment has been brought into practice with a um, rational design, and it prepares as shown in the lower figure of this slide, and this prepares for the mega thrust earthquake tsunamis that are expected to occur in the near future. So in summary for this part, the piping boiling, a seepage erosion, very capacity failure, and overflow score are closely interrelated and interrupted, which all affect the stability of coastal structures. These highlight the crucial role of overflow and seepage coupling in tsunami seabed structure interruption from both geotechnical and hydrodynamic perspectives, which warrants an enhanced disaster resilience. I now like to talk about the wave seabed structure interaction. Wave induced seabed instability considerably affects the stability of coastal and offshore structures resting on in the seabed. Representative forms and processes of the instability involve score and seabed liquefaction. Here I show that score and wave induced liquefaction are physically interconnected, affecting the stability of structures. Here I am showing some factors affecting stability of breakwaters on sandy seabed. The upper figure shows the case for case and breakwaters. Here, the sandy ground around the toe of the rubble mound may undergo liquefaction under scouring and the severe wave conditions, which may lead to significant sediment transport. Owing to this phenomena, caisson may settle into the foundation ground. Once caisson settles, it may lose or reduce its preventive function against severe ocean waves traveling toward coast and land. The lower figure shows the case for detached breakwater in a similar way. Indeed, under severe wave conditions, liquefaction or score may occur around the detached breakwater, which leads to substantial 
particle transport. Accordingly, rocks may settle into the foundation ground. All these processes are important design consideration of coastal infrastructures. Before going into the linkage between liquefaction and score, I may need to remark the basic yet important understanding of ocean wave induced liquefaction. Here I'm showing a sketch or a close up of sandy seabed saturated with water. A solid particles surrounding pore water and the granular soil, a seabed round, is subjected to severe ocean waves, which consist mainly of wave induced pressure fluctuation as well as oscillatory flow. The essence here is unstable granular structures can easily fail under dynamic environmental loadings, such as ocean waves. The physical state of given seabed soil can be expressed by a form shown in the lower figure of this slide. The void state of severe soil exists below the maximum possible void ratio, yet above the minimum possible void ratio, which may indicate that when severe soils are subjected to cyclic shearing arising from severe ocean wave conditions, it may exhibit some tendency for contraction, namely cyclic plasticity at given effective confinement <laughs> pressure, which may lead to build up of residual per water pressures and may undergo liquefaction under sufficiently severe wave conditions. Here I need to remark the basic difference between the ocean wave induced liquefaction and earthquake induced liquefaction. In contrast to the earthquake induced liquefaction, the period of ocean waves is more than an order of magnitude longer than that in earthquakes. However, the number of cycles experienced in under ocean waves is far greater than the case experienced in earthquakes. And accordingly, when seabed soils, particularly fine sands and silts with relatively low permeability are subjected to severe ocean wave conditions, they may undergo the buildup of residual poor water pressures. Here I'm showing such excess poor water pressure generation in sand beds under severe wave conditions, schematically shown in this slide. The way we induce excess pore water pressure may consist of two parts. First is fluctuating component, and the other one is the residual component, which stem from the contractive nature of sand. When this residual pore water pressure reaches its initial vertical effective confining pressure at given soil depths, liquefaction may occur. What is distinct in the ocean wave induced liquefaction is a stress pass induced seabed and does action ocean waves. In particular, liquefaction susceptibility or resistance varies substantially depending on the types of ocean waves, namely the ocean wave forms. And the progressive wave, both normal stress variations as well as horizontal shear stress variations act on the soil element of seabed soil, leading to the stress axis rotations in the seabed ground. By contrast, understanding wave that may occur in front of the impermeable particle wall, such as seawalls or prey walls or caisson, in particular under the antinode, only axial stress differences on the horizontal plane of a given soil element of the seabed soil 
leading to the stress path shown in symbol B of this slide. The contrast under the node of standing wave, only horizontal shear stress variation acts on a given horizontal plane of a soil element of seabed soil, leading to the stress variations shown in the symbol C of this slide. These distinct forms of stress paths affect substantially the liquefaction susceptibility of seabed soil. I'm showing here the comparison of liquefaction resistance to progressive and standing waves. The horizontal axis shows the cyclic source ratio, which represents the index of severity of wave loading in a similar way of aspect induced loading. Mm -hmm. the vertical mm -hmm. axis shows the residual pole pressure ratio and when it reaches the unit, the liquefaction will occur. There exists a critical cyclic source ratio below which liquefaction does not occur, which indicates the liquefaction resistance. What is important here is that the seabed soil is most susceptible to liquefaction under progressive wave due to owing principally to the effects of the rotations of principal stress, namely the wave-induced stress axis rotations, which have been shown to substantially promote the buildup of residual power water pressures. Such wind-induced stress axis rotation become pronounced in the course of wave loading. By contrast, the severe soil is least susceptible to liquefaction and as antinode of standing wave. The node of standing wave, the, the corresponding liquefaction resistance is between that and the progressive wave and under the antinode of standing waves. With this basic yet important understanding of the ocean wave in this liquefaction in mind, I would now like to talk about the wave seabed structure interaction by focusing on monopile, namely the stability of offshore wind turbine foundation. In the usual scrub protection around the pier or monopile, the diameter of the scrub protection area is three to four times the diameter of the monopile. And I show that such scrub protection is closely linked to the ocean wave in this liquefaction. Wave seabed monopile interaction was studied by a drum centrifuge wave testing, where the relevant scaling loads for wave induced seabed liquefaction, namely time scaling loads for fluid wave propagation and soil consolidation, as well as for man score, was satisfied. I'm showing here the results in the form of the horizontal axis denotes the number n, that means the extent of stone layer square protection in times the uh, monopile diameter, and the vertical axis shows the ratio of increase in liquefaction resistance to ocean waves. The results show the square protection increased the liquefaction resistance. For instance, in the usual range of square protection, every four times monopile diameter, liquefaction resistance increased by 20%. And when we use double usual range, number eight times monopile diameter, the ocean wave induced liquefaction resistance can increase by 40%. Hence, scrub protection increases the liquefaction resistance depending on the diameter ratios of the scrub protection in the pile. However, what is important here is that it could not prevent the collapse of the monopile once liquefaction occurred. This basically means the importance of source certification on the wave seabed structure interaction in light of wave induced liquefaction and scrub protection. And further, the results highlight the fact that the wave induced seabed liquefaction may need to be considered in the rational design of monopile foundations for offshore structures, such as offshore wind turbine foundations. I now present the mechanics and processes of internal erosion cavity formation and collapse behind sea walls and clay walls. These are the photographs indicating typical cavity collapses behind sea walls. As you can see, there are large cavity collapses 
which may pose substantial risks on humans as well as on infrastructures. In fact, the photograph on the left shows the site of a fatal accident where a cavity formed in the back pill behind the case on joint suddenly collapsed without giving any alarming signs to the soil surface. Investigations into the cause of such accident confirmed some key issues in internal erosion, cavity formation, and collapse behind seawalls and clay balls. Namely, first, defects in sand covers allow the sand particles to be washed out through the case and joint. The progress of internal erosion resulted in the occurrence and the evolution of cavities. Eventually, the cavities collapsed. Lesson here is that the stability of cavities in unsaturated granular back hills is of an essentially unsteady nature, owing to ocean waves, tides, groundwater table fluctuations, and precipitations. The key factors and processes involved are propagation of fluctuating water pressure, wash out of sand particles, arch effect, and roll of suction. Low of suction, that is negative pore water pressure relative to atmospheric air pressure, is of particular importance since no cavities would be formed in dry or saturated or submerged states of sand since sand has inherently no cohesion. This means that suction may control the lifetime of cavities in unsaturated granular backfills above groundwater levels that accompany flows of power fluids, both of air and water, and the complex hydro environmental loading, as I mentioned in the above. Mitigation measures are hence important against internal erosion and cavity formation. In particular, maintenance free operations are crucial for ensuring the safety of sustainable infrastructure development. Bilayered filter is effective in preventing such internal erosion, cavity formation, and collapse behind seawalls and clay walls. This is a sort of dual protection concept such that washout, cavity formation, and collapse are prevented from occurring, even if sand covers seeds fail. Diverse options are possible. Diverse measures are possible as options, such as asphalt mat or cemented soil. However, these solidified materials are susceptible to defects in and cracks when they are subject to severe dynamic forcing, such as earthquakes, and were uneven differential settlement. By contrast, filters have been shown to be stable and the various dynamic forcing such as waves, tides, and earthquakes, if they are properly designed. <laughs> International standards on filters have generally been developed for use in dams and seabeds. However, the use of filters in backfill materials, such as behind seawalls and clay walls, needs three key issues to be considered and satisfied. They are a clogging and trapping function and stability against rubble stones and performance under various dynamic forcing, such as waves, tides, and earthquakes. Before going into the filter designs, I would like to remark the basic yet important physics behind the internal erosion, cavity formation, and cracks particularly the role of suction, how it may affect the process and forms of internal erosion, cavity formation and collapse. I'm showing here two different types of sands, in which in the relatively coarse sands with low suction profiles, by contrast in fine sands with relatively high suction profiles above groundwater levels. These two different types of sands with different suctions 
substantially affect the process and forms of internal erosion cavity formation collapse. For illustrative purposes, I'm showing here a video of the model experiment. At the center of the model ground, there exists a thread through which wash out occurred. And how this is the case for fine sands with relatively high suction profiles. With continuing wash out, the cavity starts to be formed and continues to grow. Because higher suction supports larger cavity, the top of the cavity uh, tends to be flattened because of the high holding capacity. And what is important here is that even if the large cavity develops below the ground surface and the top of the cavity approaches the ground surface, they barely leave any alarming signs on the soil surface. Yet large cavities eventually lead to collapse as shown in this video. Now no alarming signs yet suddenly and abruptly collapse. In contrast, this is a case for coarse sands with relatively low suction profile and set up as a sign. The form of and the process or speed of cavity development is distinctly different in the case of coarse sands. A cone-shaped cavity because the lower suction of lower holding capacity of the cavity and they leave no alarm signs on soil surface. Yet they eventually lead to collapse, literally more rapidly than the case for fine sands with high suction profile. When, in case of using filter that is appropriately designed for the targeted sand, even if severe hydrodynamic forcing no significant washout, no cavities, and no collapse would occur throughout the entire period of hydrodynamic forcing. So different types of sands with different sections, the physical states of sand affect substantially the processes of collapse and cavity formation. In coarse sands with little low suction leads to cone-shaped cavity due to the lower holding capacity of cavity and the cavity reaches the ground surface more rapidly than the case with fine sand with high suction, which leads to a large cavity. For both types of sand, even if this, the cavity develops to a moderate size, such as one meter diameter below the 50 centimeter beneath the ground surface, they barely leave any alarming signs on the soil surface. This means that the cavities abruptly collapse. Hence, preventive measures are crucial, crucially important. Filters that are appropriately, appropriately designed work properly and prevent such internal erosion, cavity formation, and collapse and the various dynamic forcing involving waves, tides, and earthquakes. Recent research has shown that the grading of filters, in particular, uniformity coefficient is a key for satisfying all the three functions that I mentioned and keeping the preventive function against internal erosion, cavity formation and perhaps throughout the service period of the infrastructure and has been shown to be stable under various dynamic forcing. Consistent with technical standards for or filters for dams and seabed, rational criteria has been developed for use in backfill materials behind seawalls and firewalls. An example shown here, it is for practical use, it is formulated with regard to uniformity coefficient and the grain size ratio in terms of D50 for filters and sands. Such criteria applies to the upper filter layer, while the lower filter with grading larger than and adjacent to the first, that of first upper filter layer. For other relevant information, 
I please refer to the paper of the workshop of the Springer volume. Such by layered filter has been applied to an important infrastructure such as airport. The mitigation measure was taken to prevent internal erosion and cavity formation gaps around the box calibers subject to wave propagation and has proven necessary for safe and maintenance free operation of the important waterfront infrastructure. Now I'd like to summarize the key contents. I have presented some recent advances in the mechanics and the countermeasures of score and internal erosion through the tsunami wave seabed structure interactions. Progress of seepage erosion beneath rubble mounds leads to the settlement of case and breakwaters. Tsunami overflow and seepage coupling promotes the development of score with mound and seabed ground, resulting in the total failure of case and breakwaters. Tsunami resistant design of breakwaters has been developed and brought into practice so as to prepare for the future mega thrust earthquake tsunamis. Wave induced liquefaction and square protection around the monopile are physically interconnected, affecting the performance of offshore wind turbine foundations. Then highlighted some key issues in the mechanics and countermeasures of internal erosion, cavity formation and collapse behind seawalls and fray walls. I think Sherry hope that this may facilitate a better understanding of the physics involved pertaining to geohazard mitigation. And that's all for my content, and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I have questions from my side itself that um, I think you have proposed a revised uh, filter criteria. What is your comment on the Tezagi filter criteria? Uh, based on no, all your expertise, comment on Tezagi's filter criteria. Yeah. Comment on what? They, they mean, you mean filter design? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, filter design. That, that this criteria is very consistent with the uh, criteria used for dams and dams and uh, seabed. But the difference is that the uh, stems from the basic uh, difference in the expected hydraulic gradient that would okay. occur in the case of dams and in, in the case of battery materials. Mm -hmm. For instance, in the case of dams, the highest hydraulic gradient would be around. 10, but in the case of uh, sea walls or clay walls, it will be around uh, two at most. Hence, the, we, we can uh, achieve an efficient and cost-effective design of filters. And the, another important point is that the, often the filters subjected to dynamic things such as earthquakes, so the filters need to be stable and uh, not just hydrodynamic forcing, but also the other types of dynamic forcing and the, the, the design develop the, is a, ensure achieve the safety in such dynamic loading. And that is a, a noble issue of this uh, design. Yeah, there is a one question by uh, Professor Bina. How the tsunami effect affects the beach sand deposit and whether the Liquefaction happens due to uh, tsunami in seashore. Oh, tsunami, tsunami and liquefaction, yes. Tsunami and liquefaction are also interrelated, but uh, I, I did not mention that part. That the basic difference between tsunami and waves, uh, uh, the tsunami is uh, long waves, long period waves, and the waves, uh, the period is uh, distinctly shorter than the case of tsunamis. But the, in the case of tsunamis as well, the liquefaction has been shown to be shown to occur, yet the types of liquefaction is different. The wave in this liquefaction mostly in residual power pressure build up, but the tsunami induced liquefaction is closely related to the uh, oscillatory uh, liquefaction that is uh, that that is closely linked to the this uh, this oscillatory fluctuating component. That means uh, under the, the receding uh, tsunami the, from land, the 
cyclic boiling, the, this is one form of liquefaction, may occur under tsunamis. So the types of liquefaction that may occur under tsunamis and waves are different, yet uh, of course the under tsunami liquefaction may occur under more severe conditions. Thank you very so much, I Professor. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. I think there could be, it's a very interesting, brilliant lecture. I request all the speakers, they can post their questions in the chat box. We'll give it, we'll uh, compile all of them and give it to the speaker later. Uh, and uh, thank you, Professor uh, Cindy Sister.